Uh, without further uh, delay, I'm going to hand the floor to Rose. And thank you so much, Rose, for giving us this opportunity to interact with you. Not at all. Thank you, Ella, for the very kind invitation. I was very honoured to be asked and I hope that this talk will um, be of interest to you. When I first sat down to write it, I sort of thought, well, um, you know, do I just talk about the guidelines or do I talk about the development or do I sort of try and um, tell you a little story? And I decided to, that I would uh, weave this into a bit of a story. Um, so I am actually a neonatal nurse by profession. Um, uh, I trained originally in Sydney. Uh, and then after I finished my midwifery, I actually came and worked in London for a couple of years and I worked down at St George's Hospital in um, Tooting. Uh, and it was there that I um, started working in the neonatal intensive care unit and I nearly stayed and did the EMB 405 course. This is 1991. Um, but in the end, I actually came back to Australia to do my Master of Nursing um, and uh, here I am, well, 30 years, literally 30 years this year. Um, I now live in Melbourne where I've been for the past 23 years. Um, I work predominantly on our baby's newborn emergency transport service, um, at, which is called Piper. Um, and that is a very long winded way of saying the Pediatric Infant Perinatal Emergency Retrieval Service. But it was from that work really where my PhD work was driven because over those years of working uh, in retrieval, neonatal retrieval, I became really interested in outcomes of babies born in non-tertiary hospitals uh, and why it is that, or was that despite our best care, um, our best transport card, um, you know, a dedicated team, um, that often these babies um, had such poorer outcomes. Uh, and so, Rose, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yep. We just need, uh, are you sharing your presentation? I will do shortly. Yep. No, my apologies. I shall do. Yep. Just giving you a bit of a blurb. Um, yep. But yeah, so that was that was kind of the background. Actually, I'll start sharing now, Alex, so you don't uh, get anxious. I'm going to show you something exciting. Um, so there it is. Yeah. Um, and so for the, my postdoctoral work has really been around um, trying to improve outcomes for extremely preterm babies, particularly those born in non-tertiary hospitals. And this was um, how it came to be um, that I took on this role of helping to develop these statewide guidelines um, for Victoria. And I always find it interesting when we use the words limits of viability because um, in many ways, um, and I often think about this word, um, you know, what do we really mean by the limits of viability? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, the Latin uh, viva, vita, tells you it means alive. But uh, there's various definitions, but really the capability of the fetus to survive outside the uterus. And when I think about my career as a neonatal nurse, I can remember a time where if you were under 28 weeks, you weren't considered to be viable, as in, uh, you know, you wouldn't receive resuscitation. I was thinking how much things have really changed um, over that time. So what's happening around the world? Well, we know at the moment there is actually a really wide variation in the way um, management of these extremely preterm babies born at the really lower limits um, of viability, if you like, or the most immature babies at 22 to 24 weeks, how they manage both here in Australia, both within different states of Australia, and certainly internationally. And there was a systematic review published by Guyan in 2015, which they identified 34 guidelines from 24 countries from four interprofessional bodies, um, all trying to develop guidance around how to manage these extremely preterm babies. And what we know, of course, is that there is an increased willingness to offer active care to these um, tiny babies in many countries, but certainly not all. And this was some work I published a couple of years ago now, which was just looking at the variations in rate of active management from a couple of cohorts um, here in Victoria, so in the white and the blue, uh, in France in 2011, in the UK, now this was back in 2006, uh, and in Sweden um, at a similar time frame. And what you can see back then was at 22 weeks that the Swedish were quite proactive um, in the UK, just over 10% of babies were being actively managed, or 13%. A uh, very, very tiny proportion in France and Victoria was around 5%. Again, at 23 weeks, we saw this huge variation in this, uh, in the way countries approached it. So again, uh, the UK and Sweden up here, France down here in green, um, and here's the two cohorts from Victoria. 
And it really wasn't until 25 weeks gestation that we started seeing fairly universal approach um, to active management. But we know, of course, that management of these pregnancies and these babies involves some really important clinical decisions uh, and important ethical decisions, which I'll get to shortly. But in terms of clinical decisions, uh, do you give the woman antenatal corticosteroids? And at what gestational age do you start? Do you start at 21 plus five? How early do you administer a magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection? How early do you transfer the woman to a tertiary perinatal center? Um, do you wait till she's 24 weeks or do you transfer when she's 21 or 22? How are you going to birth that baby? Because obviously, uh, if you do a cesarean section at 22 weeks, then it's going to have to be um, a classical. And that will obviously have implications for that woman's future pregnancies um, in terms of risk of uterine rupture. Do you resuscitate the baby at birth? And how aggressive are you with that resuscitation? And then do you offer that baby neonatal intensive care? And that might mean transferring them from a non-tertiary hospital to a tertiary perinatal centre. And of course, that decision to provide active management or passive care or palliative care or comfort care as the many names we use for it, really determines the baby's outcome because it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you do not provide active care, then the baby will die. So I then, or before we started the guideline, I started looking at then what was happening around the world right now. And this is the most, um, some data from Sweden. And these couple of slides, I'm only looking at all lot work, studies that use all live births as the denominator, and not studies that only report NICU admissions. So we can see in Sweden that at 22 weeks, it had 96 live births and 52% of those babies were offered intensive care with a one year survival rate of nearly 60%. So fairly impressive. At 23 weeks, you can see in Sweden, close 93% of live births were offered intensive care with 66% survival. And at 24 weeks, it was close to 100% in Sweden, uh, again, with very high survival rates. What about in the UK? Well, this is the latest data from um, uh, the Embrace report. So these were babies born across the UK in 2016. And we saw at 22 weeks, there was 183 live births, only 15% offered intensive care. But the babies who were offered intensive care um, did quite well with more than half of the babies surviving. And again, you can see the data for 23 weeks and for 24 weeks. What about in Norway? So in Norway, um, I'd say only 17 live births, but nearly a third were offered intensive care and about 60% alive at one year. So again, look at the denominators, you know, 60%, you think, wow, that's a high survival rate. Um, but they only offered intensive care to five babies and they had three survivors. So uh, again, the importance of looking at your denominators. And in Western Australia, which has really to date only been the only state in Australia who has been proactive with managing these very immature babies, this is the 24, 2004 to 2010 data from WA, you can see 60 babies live born, only five offered intensive care, uh, and three of those babies survived, again, giving them a <laughs> inadvertent comma 60% survival rate. So again, we can see um, wide variation around the world at the moment. Um, this was France, uh, again, no babies at 22 weeks offered intensive care and the Netherlands uh, intensive care not offered prior to 24 weeks. So it's not universal that all babies born alive at 22 weeks or even 23 weeks are actually offered intensive care. Um, I'm just going to skip over, I'll show you this, but um, this is, uh, actually we'll talk about it, but then you've got to look at, well, what about if they do survive to NICU? And I think what was um, surprising when I looked at this was perhaps people perceived that these very immature babies had very poor survival rates. And if they did survive, they would have very um, uh, profound disabilities. We'll talk about that later. But in fact, the most recent data are a little bit more reassuring than perhaps many people think. So what's been happening here in Victoria? So just to orientate you, for those who have not been to Victoria, uh, we are geographically the smallest state of mainland Australia, but we have the second highest proportion of births in the country. 
So the highest proportion of births are in New South Wales, followed by Victoria. And Western Australia, which is the biggest state, has the lowest proportion of births. So here in Victoria, we have about 80,000 births a year. Um, same statistics as anywhere, 8.3% of preterm. So it's around um, 6,500 preterm births a year. And although we may look small, uh, if I put Victoria or put Australia uh, on top of the map of Europe, um, here's Victoria covering this geographical area down here, uh, and here is the whole of the UK. So in fact, Victoria is only slightly smaller than the whole UK um, put together. So just to put that into a little bit of perspective about the land size that we're dealing with. And so how was it that we came to develop this clinical guidance for these births at 22 to 24 weeks gestation? Well, the first thing that happened in Victoria back in 2017 was an organisation called Safer Care Victoria was established. And this was in response to the recommendations from a report called Targeting Zero. And Targeting Zero was a report um, that really looked at ways we could support hospital systems in Victoria to eliminate avoidable harm and really strengthen quality of care. And so Safer Care works with healthcare services and clinicians and consumers to uh, run improvement projects, to develop evidence-based guidelines, um, to review adverse events, uh, and to monitor sentinel events. Um, so that was uh, 2017 that that was established. And then in 2018, there was a parliamentary inquiry into perinatal services in Victoria. And one of the key findings of the inquiry was that they recognised there was um, real disparity in outcomes um, between babies and women who lived in regional areas versus in the metropolitan area. Uh, there were challenges retaining workforce out in the regional areas in Victoria. And among the many recommendations that came out of this report was that the government, the Victorian government, committed to developing shared policies and protocols in obstetric and neonatal care for health services across Victoria. So instead of each hospital having its own policies and procedures, that the recommendation was that there would be statewide policies developed um, to improve care. And another recommendation 3.4 was the government um, would engage with Victorian hospitals to develop a training package on bereavement care um, for healthcare practitioners. The following year, a group called the Neonatal Advisory Committee, and this is a group made up of um, tertiary um, neonatal uh, consultant um, neonatologists, um, uh, the nurse unit managers, um, uh, and other um, senior level neonatal staff. And again, what they recognised was around Victoria, we really had differing practices in the way that these births were being managed. And what, the, um, what NAG identified was really that we needed consensus from our tertiary centres uh, and from Piper, our neonatal retrieval team, about the guidance that we were giving to non-tertiary clinicians. Because what we were seeing happen was depending on what consultant might have been on for Piper that night, that uh, different advice was being given to um, hospitals, um, different recommendations were being given to different hospitals, um, and that there was really inconsistent approach to the way um, we accepted in utero transfers into tertiary centres. We also, or NAG came to the conclusion that we really needed a consensus on the definition of the zone of parental discretion. I'll really focus on this tonight. But also that Victorian women had the right for equitable access to high-risk counselling, irrespective of what hospital they uh, were booked at or where they lived in Victoria, um, to help them make informed decisions about their baby's care. And with all this happening at the time, Safer Care then funded this project um, to develop the Extreme Prematurity Guideline. Um, they appointed a project officer, which was myself, um, and then I um, uh, brought together an expert working group, very similar to how the BAMF um, guidelines were developed in the UK. Uh, and the tertiary and the working group consisted of obstetricians, neonatologists, both tertiary and non-tertiary, uh, regional paediatricians, um, GP obstetricians. So these are general practitioners who do obstetrics. Um, and these are often um, 
the sole practitioners, um, as in there's not a paediatrician in many of our smaller hospitals. Um, we had a neonatal nurse and midwife, and we also had a consumer who was a mum of a baby who was born at 23 weeks. And so we were tasked with developing this guideline. And so when we sat down and looked at, well, what did we need? We realised that, first of all, we needed a consensus statement defining the zone of parental discretion. And this, I think, was um, in many ways the hardest part of the guideline. Uh, and this took a lot of work. And um, I'll tell you a bit more about this shortly. Um, obviously, we wanted to develop guidelines for management of the woman who was at high risk of birthing at 22 to 24 weeks. And what we had to take into consideration for that was that one size was not going to fit all, that the guidelines for management in a tertiary perinatal centre uh, would be different to a woman who presented to a small regional um, level one hospital. And for the same reason, we also have to have guidelines for management of the baby immediately after birth for, for both tertiary and non-tertiary hospitals. But that we also needed to um, develop guidance around palliative care and how that would happen and where that would happen um, versus active management of the baby. And then the fourth component was to develop parent information sheets for parents of babies who were born at 22, 23 or 24 weeks gestation um, to give them some tangible written information on what it meant to have a baby born that early and what were some of their options in terms of active or palliative care uh, and what some likely outcomes might be for the baby if the baby was offered intensive care. So the first thing we had to do was actually define what we actually meant by active management versus palliative care. And when we thought about this in terms of active management, it was very important that it was clear that this was something that started well before the baby's birth. So you didn't just wait for the baby to be born and then decide, now you're going to um, institute active management. And therefore, if um, a woman wanted active management, then that would happen before birth. Um, so the aim was to provide obstetric and neonatal care directed towards providing life-saving perinatal interventions that would optimise that baby's survival chances and of surviving without major neurosensory disability. And if the parents chose palliative or comfort care, then that would mean that obstetric and neonatal management was not directed towards providing life-saving interventions for the baby, and that the agreed plan would be to provide comfort care for the baby after birth. And of course, we then had to think about uh, what are we going to do in the situation where parents change their mind? And that was um, uh, another, <laughs> Uh, ethically, uh, we can have a lot of talks about that at the end of the session, but uh, uh, another very challenging area. And so it was really important for us, first of all, to sort of understand, well, how many babies were we, were we talking about in Victoria? Um, where were these babies being born? Um, how, how often, or like what proportion of babies were currently being active, uh, act, sorry, offered active versus palliative care? Um, how many survived? What were their long-term outcomes? Um, were there any existing guidelines for clinicians that we could actually draw from? And um, very fortuitously at the time, the Banff guidelines um, had just gone out for public feedback. And so we had the opportunity to look at the Banff guidelines um, and comment on those. Uh, and then the um, final Banff guidelines were published when we were midway through developing the Victorian one. So that was extremely helpful for us to sort of look at um, were we aligning? But what was interesting was we saw the same challenges um, for those developing the Banff guidelines as we experienced here. And of course, we also look for, um, you know, what uh, resources were, were there for families. So just to quickly tell you a little bit about what we were dealing with in Victoria. Um, like every year in Victoria, and this is my most recent data, this has just recently been published, so you can um, uh, see this paper, but around 100 babies are live born at 22 to 24 weeks in Victoria every year. So it's not a, an insubstantial number of babies for whom we're having to make really, really important decisions um, about their care. Uh, quite differently to what we're seeing perhaps in the UK and Sweden and, and other countries is there is still a um, uh, very much a reluctance at this point to uh, offer active management to babies born at 22 weeks. 
So we can see in the babies who were born between 2009 and 17, only 5% of live births at 22 weeks in Victoria were offered intensive care. And what was interesting about those babies, it was 10 babies, was that five of them were actually born in paramedic practice, meaning that they were born either at home accidentally um, or were born in an ambulance on the way to a hospital. And um, in fact, of all the babies who were actively resuscitated, only two were born in a tertiary centre. So um, that was quite interesting. At 23 weeks, we saw uh, the differences started. So 55% in Victoria still offered comfort care, so very different to the UK, uh, and 45% actively managed. And by 24 weeks, we saw almost a complete reversal of what we were seeing at 22 weeks, and that was that just 10% um, uh, uh, were offered palliative care and 90% were actively managed. And I should point out, these were babies who did not have major congenital anomalies that would have been um, life limiting anomalies. So these were um, babies, uh, live births free of lethal anomalies. But what was interesting about them was when we looked at um, where they were born, we saw that in fact, um, nearly half of the 22 weekers were being born in tertiary centres. Um, we thought it was interesting that in fact, caesarean sections were being performed for these, not for many, but for a few very immature babies. But when we looked deeper into the data, what we saw was in fact that of those um, who were delivered by caesarean section, it was usually for maternal indications, not for fetal indications. So the caesarean section was done to save the mother's life. So for example, where there was um, a fulminating hypertension, um, preeclampsia or eclampsia. And we saw a really low antenatal corticosteroid rates um, for the 22 week babies. Um, but that went up considerably at 23, and then it was nearly 80% by 24. So that was the data for, that was all live births. But when we actually looked at actively managed babies, we saw quite a different story. So only 20% of actively managed babies were actually born in tertiary centres. Fairly equal proportions of 23 and 24 weekers, but that also meant there were 15% of um, very immature babies being outborn and actively managed, so born in non-tertiary hospitals and then being transported um, by the Piper Retrieval Team to a tertiary centre after birth. Uh, again, we saw that increase in caesarean section rate from between 22 to 24 weeks uh, and a much higher uptake of antenatal corticosteroids. Um, now I'll tell you what happened to these babies shortly, but uh, the other um, interesting issue that we looked at was um, where these babies were being born and how likely they were uh, to be actively managed. So just to tell you again, a little bit to orientate you with Victoria. So you remember about the size of the whole UK. Now we have 67 hospitals. We currently have um, uh, three, oh, sorry, four now, um, uh, what you would call level three or tertiary centres, we now call them level six, level six A and B. Uh, and all our tertiary centres are located in the Melbourne metropolitan area. So imagine if every baby born in the UK had to come to Manchester to receive intensive care. Uh, that is the best analogy I can give you to sort of relate. So um, all our other hospitals are located anywhere up to um, our furthest hospitals, about 550 kilometres from um, the nearest tertiary centre down here in Melbourne. Um, so we have a number of very small level one hospitals that um, don't have paediatricians on site, um, certainly don't have an infant ventilator, um, uh, have a very basic nursery, um, limited diagnostic services for, you know, for doing blood gases. Um, um, so really challenging uh, for these um, smaller hospitals if they have extremely preterm babies born there. So what did we see with the outborn babies? Well, we saw, not surprisingly, that they were less likely to be offered active management at birth. There were some pretty good reasons for that. But they're also less likely to receive life-saving perinatal interventions before birth. Um, so we saw that 43% of our outborns versus 91% of our actively managed inborns, for example, received corticosteroids. We saw that outborn babies were less likely to be successfully resuscitated. So even when resuscitation attempts were made, that the babies who were outborn um, 
21% uh, of them died before they could be transferred to a tertiary centre versus just 3% of inborn babies. So that was important because what it says, you know, if, if the parents want active management, then really um, trying to get that baby born in a tertiary centre is incredibly important. Uh, not surprisingly, we saw, of course, um, that if they were actively managed, they were still less likely to survive to one year of age. And so it was really armed with all this knowledge that we then had to sit down um, uh, and, um, and sorry, I should just say though, there were some pretty good reasons for those differences. As I pointed out, there, there were women who delivered at home or en route to hospital, about 6%. There were women who presented in precipitate labour to these small hospitals and there was just no time for in utero transfer. There were births that were undertaken for maternal indication, so um, cesarean sections to save the mother's life. Uh, as we saw, a higher proportion of outborns died in the delivery room. Um, but we also saw that in utero transfer was not always accepted by a tertiary centre until the woman was 24 weeks. So sometimes the hospital would ring and say, we would like to transfer this woman, she's 23 weeks and whatever days, um, the family have been counselled, they want active care, um, but the tertiary centres would say, um, no, call, you know, ring us back when she's 24 weeks. Um, so that was a problem. Uh, and the other thing we saw was that perhaps decision making based to not opt to active management may have been on perceived risks of death or disability, um, or sorry, survival with disability. And we actually questioned whether um, even clinicians counselling parents um, actually had accurate perceptions of outcome of these babies. And this is what, um, sorry, I should say, this was some work I did as part of my PhD work where we actually looked at, do, do clinicians um, who are counselling these parents about active or palliative care, about survival chances, about potential outcomes, um, how, how accurate are their um, perceptions? And as we all know, it is incredibly hard to keep up with outcome data. And the other challenge is that by the time it's published or you've done the follow-up of the babies and it's published, um, it's 10 years down the track. And can you compare the outcomes of babies born in England in the Epicure study with babies who were born in France in Epipage with babies who were born in Australia? So it's very difficult for clinicians to keep up to date. But what we showed, and this was um, a little study we did where um, I asked clinicians from, so this was our midwives and nurses, obstetricians, tertiary centre staff and our transport team, what do you think the chances are of a baby surviving if they're outborn at 24 weeks? And at the time, the true survival rate was 37%. Um, now, as you can see from the box and whisker plots, and just to orientate you in all of these, the median, sorry, the solid line is the median. The outer ends of the box plots are the 75th and 25th centile and the whiskers are the 95th and the 5th centile. So across every profession, even obstetrics and tertiary centre staff, we saw that people underestimated survival. We then said to them, what do you think of the risks of major disability in a surviving infant? And we defined that as major problems with walking, talking, thinking, seeing, hearing. And what we saw was again across the board, that people thought that if you were outborn and you were 24 weeks and you survived, that your chance of major disability would be somewhere around 70% when in fact the true rate was down here. And we asked the exact same question of staff, well, what about babies who were inborn? Uh, and we saw people were closer in their estimates of what the true survival rate was, but generally underestimated survival. But once again, this huge overestimation of disability. And this really um, uh, made us question then, what are we telling the parents of extremely preterm babies? And so this all had to be taken account when we started developing this guidance for births. And it was uh, a huge project. Um, and I look back now and think, how on earth did we do it? So the first thing we had to do was we had to define the same parental And I'm sure for all of you doing an ethics module, you will be very familiar with this concept, but of course the zone of parental discretion refers to an ethically protected space. 
where parents have the discretion to choose between active versus palliative management for their baby. At gestational, gestational ages where outcomes of medical treatment are, in, are uncertain. And throughout all phases of um, counselling and decision making, of course, the emphasis always on shared decision making with the treating team and the parents. But in the zone of parental discretion, it's ethically legitimate for parents to make the final decision, even if that is not what the treating team um, would necessarily uh, recommend. Um, and we really looked uh, and drew very heavily in, and I thank Dominic Wilkinson um, from um, uh, the John Radcliffe for his assistance on this as well, but because Dom was fantastic uh, in helping us. Um, decisions about whether active care is within the zone of parental discretion must incorporate an assessment of the likelihood of both mortality and morbidity for the baby that considers both gestational age, but also other factors that we know affect fetal and maternal health. And I'll talk about those. And when it's determined that a combined outcome of greater than 90% or of surviving with severe disability constitutes harm. Oops, I'm just gonna pop you on mute there. No, actually I can't do it. Alok, you can put that person on mute. Um, so when it's determined that a combined outcome of greater than 90% chance of dying or surviving with severe disability constitutes harm, then active management is not considered to be in the best interest of the baby. And so we came up with um, this diagram, uh, the zone of parental discretion. And it's a continuum um, and therefore it's not the colours are not solid. There's no um, uh, sort of, it's a continuum of care. But we decided that below 22 weeks and zero days, that life-saving interventions would not be supported, even if the parents really wanted it. That below 22 weeks, there really was, you know, no chance for the baby. That, uh, that 24 plus naught or above, that active management would be provided unless there were significant adverse risk factors um, uh, to not provide active care. And therefore the zone of parental discretion we decided sat somewhere between 22 plus naught and 23 plus six weeks. But within the zone of parental discretion, there is a huge emphasis on both shared decision-making, respecting family values and beliefs. However, the management plan will also take into account realistic assessment of individual risk factors that will determine the strength of the directions in one direction or the other. So if you were outborn, that would push the zone of parental discretion this way. If you were severely growth restricted, uh, if you were male, <laughs> uh, if you were a multiple, um, if you had an anomaly, um, whether or not your mother had been given antenatal corticosteroids. So for example, we decided that if a baby was outborn below 23 weeks, then that in fact would not be within the zone of parental discretion. So the idea of the zone of parental discretion is that it is yeah, a continuum um, that can move in other direction. But when we first designed this, the upper limit of the zone of parental discretion, we actually had at 25 plus naught weeks. And when we um, put our first um, guideline out for review and sector feedback and public feedback, we got a lot of very strong pushback, um, particularly from the tertiary neonatologists that they would not feel comfortable not resuscitating a well-grown 24 weeker in the absence of other risk factors. And so when we um, came up with the final version of the zone of parental discretion, uh, we did lower the um, limit to, to 24 weeks. Now, um, yes, so I've just uh, said all that. Um, some of the parent counselling considerations uh, when you're going to talk to these parents. Now, obviously, uh, it's very hard at the time, but you're trying to um, help the parent or encourage the family to consider both the immediate and long-term outcomes. And um, I'm sure you've all seen this, but that initial reaction often that the parents just want everything done. Um, as our obstetricians say, you know, put the stitch in, um, give antenatal corticosteroids, you know, do everything. Um, but this might not necessarily reflect their final decision once they've had time for counselling and to really consider all the options. And parent counselling, of course, also needs to um, consider um, 
obstetric and neonatal factors that may um, uh, really change, um, again, uh, the direction of the zone of parental discretion. So for example, in situations where the mother's had prolonged, preterm prolonged rupture of membranes, um, or has oligohydramnios at you know, critical time points when the fetal lungs are growing, uh, whether she has got evidence of chorioamnionitis uh, and sepsis, uh, in multiple pregnancies, is there evidence of twin to twin transfusion syndrome or fetal growth restriction? Uh, again, as I talked about cesarean section, what implications does that have for future pregnancies and whether there's any congenital anomalies? And although it sounds all very easy for us to say, well, this is the zone of parental discretion, um, we know that for parents making um, decisions within the zone, that this is really, really hard. And I will send you this paper, but this is a beautiful paper written by Jenny O'Neill. And she is actually a nurse at the Royal Children's Hospital here in Melbourne. And uh, Jenny works in developmental medicine, interestingly. Um, but several years ago, Jenny, uh, in 2007, uh, Jenny's daughter um, was born extremely preterm at 23 weeks um, in a non-tertiary hospital. And at that time, Jenny's obstetrician was away. Um, and so she had an obstetrician that she'd not met who came in to talk to her about the decisions that they had to make about whether or not to offer intensive care for Lily. Um, uh, it's a, a wonderful article. It really um, gives you a beautiful viewpoint of the parents, but some of the statements that really um, stood out to me in this, and then Jenny is a friend of mine, but she said, um, in this paper, the gray zone felt like an impossible place to be. A matter of days earlier or a week later and the burden of decision-making would have been quite different. She said, my mother was with us at the time and as she left the room, she said, Jenny, whatever decision you make, it will be the right one. And in this moment, I couldn't understand this statement. How could either decision that we were faced with be the right one when both options seem so wrong? So um, I think, uh, I don't ever envy anyone who has to go and counsel parents um, about these choices and, um, and certainly being parents um, uh, of these babies, uh, you know, must be extremely hard to make these um, very, very difficult decisions. So just briefly to show you some of the considerations we thought about for care of the woman um, in the guideline, both in tertiary and non-tertiary hospitals. We decided that if uh, active management was going to be provided, then that would mean uh, in utero transfer to a tertiary centre. Um, and that would, if the parents were adamant that they wanted resuscitation from 22 weeks uh, and there was no other adverse risk factors that we would transfer in utero. That antenatal corticosteroids, if the mother was at risk of birthing at 22 weeks would be offered from 21 plus five but we wouldn't routinely give antenatal corticosteroids to all women um, at 21 plus five, only if it was um, evident that the woman might deliver at 22 and that they strongly wanted resuscitation, that we would administer fetal um, magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection. Um, the mode of birth still very, very contentious, but it would be discussed with the mother um, about the risk for her current pregnancy, uh, sorry, for her future pregnancies. But what we saw with most of these babies was the vast majority of them actually spontaneously labour and actually deliver vaginally. So um, mode of birth is not always such a big issue to discuss. Fetal monitoring and labour is recommended, but of course extremely hard um, to try and get a fetal heart. Um, uh, monitoring when a woman is only 22 or 23 weeks pregnant can be very challenging. And if the parents had opted for palliative care, then we would still consider in utero transfer to a tertiary centre, even if that was just for counselling. So if the parents were unsure or didn't know, but were leaning towards palliative care, but weren't positive, uh, you know, 100% convinced that's what they wanted, that, that they should still be offered, um, if they wanted it, to be transferred to a tertiary centre so they could receive further counselling from um, high-risk obstetricians and neonatologists. And that didn't um, mean that they would have to have active care. Um, it would just give them that opportunity to have more time and to have counselling with people um, who um, are obviously expert in this. But that we wouldn't give antenatal steroids, we wouldn't give magnesium sulfate, and there would be no caesarean sections for fetal indications. 
And so the flow charts we came up with look like this, and I will send you all these, so there's no need for you to try and have a look at this, but we had our flow chart for non-tertiary units and, um, and tertiary units. And one of the key principles for non-tertiary was that when the woman presented, that within 30 minutes of her presenting at that hospital, that she would be assessed clinically by a senior um, staff member of um, the obstetric or, or um, maternity team, um, that if she was at high risk of birthing, that there would be counselling, uh, determination whether transfer to a tertiary centre was safe, um, and um, that's what the parents wanted, um, and then initiate the active care pathway. Um, so that's what the um, maternal guideline looks like. Um, and as I said, uh, if after counselling the parents are uncertain or clearly want active management, then we felt that in utero transfer should be offered from 22 weeks. Um, and that doesn't necessarily imply that active management will be the ultimate approach, um, but that was important. And the other component we wrote into the guideline was that um, a lack of NICU beds or a bed block in maternal beds in tertiary centres, which we see uh, many days here in Victoria, um, should not um, stop the in utero transfer of a very immature baby. And that the transfer of a woman who was greater than 25 weeks should not take precedence of the transfer of a woman who is less than 25 weeks. So that irrespective of the gestational age, that both women uh, would be given exactly the same, um, uh, well, in utero transfer would be undertaken with the same level of um, enthusiasm. And that once there was consensus for an urgent transfer, that no beds uh, could not impede the delivery of best care. Um, and if barriers were met, then the bed finding process would be escalated to, um, to a higher level to find that woman a bed. In terms of the baby, again, we had to look at both tertiary and non-tertiary care. So for active management, we said that ideally the baby would be inborn in a tertiary center. And that if that was not possible, then to consult with the, I'm sorry, with the Piper team as soon as possible, um, if outborn birth was unavoidable. Um, obviously for active management, that the baby would be resuscitated at birth. And ideally that a consultant led team would resuscitate that baby. Now in many hospitals in Victoria, um, uh, there won't be a paediatric consultant, um, but so this was ideal practice, best practice, uh, and that you would then admit that baby to um, an intensive care unit. And if you're offering palliative care, then they could be inborn or outborn, that we would discuss with the parents where they would like their baby cared for. Um, did they want to stay at the birth hospital where they know the staff, they, they've got their family, they've got their supports, um, or do they want to be moved down to Melbourne, um, which may be 500 kilometres away from their home and their other children, um, that the baby um, should stay with the parents as long as the parents desired and that um, hospitals should be able to find, um, provide a cuddle cot, which is the, all the cooling cots. Um, we talked about how supporting parents to create memories and helping hospitals that may not um, necessarily have a lot of experience with um, pall palliating a live born baby to, to help them and that it was really important that there was opportunities for these parents for bereavement care and for follow-up. Um, and so again, the active management pathway for the baby really is again around, um, again, resuscitation. And that brought us to the parent information sheets. And one of the first things we did was we went to our consumer advisory group um, at the Murdoch Children's where I do my research. And this is a group of parents and ex-premature babies. Um, uh, and the parents are parents of current babies in NICU, uh, babies who were in NICU 20 years ago, um, parents whose babies died and parents whose babies have survived. Um, and of the survivors, some are parents of children who are quite disabled and others are parents of babies who've done extremely well. And so we went to the consumer advisory group for their help into developing the parent information sheets because we felt they had the lived experience. Um, they, they'd been through it um, and they knew more than we could ever imagine what it was like to have a baby born this early. And in the first focus group I ran with them, um, some of the reflections of the group, um, and I remember this mum saying this was, she said, we weren't given any written information at the time. And I really wish that we had because we were just told uh, and we had to make a decision. Um, 
And what was interesting was when we did the parent information sheets, we didn't think parents would want really specific information on numbers. We didn't think they'd want statistics. Um, but they told us they, they did want numbers, but they wanted to know how many babies would be deaf, how many babies would be blind, how many babies would have cerebral palsy. Um, and so we ended up putting um, that information into the parent sheets. They told us very clearly that they wanted a description and they wanted detail of what comfort care would actually entail. What would happen if they chose comfort care? And they wanted the details around um, what that would mean. But they also wanted details about what it would mean to have a baby in intensive care. So what sort of procedures would the babies routinely go through? How long would a baby stay in intensive care if they were born at 22 weeks? Um, and we talked to them about what about having photos and images and they decided that these would be too emotive before birth. Um, and that each tertiary unit has its own information book that has pictures of their ventilators and their equipment and um, uh, information about that particular unit. And so we decided, or the parents decided, um, that we wouldn't put images of babies into the parent sheets. Um, and so that was the decision that we made to not do that. And so for each gestational age, we have parent information sheets um, that use infographics as well as information. And so we talked about in terms of survival in ideal circumstances, and that would be born in a level six, or sorry, a, a tertiary center, and mother had received antenatal corticosteroids, and that this was the chances um, of the baby surviving. And then we have in less than ideal circumstances, which would be not born in a tertiary perinatal center and no antenatal corticosteroids um, to show them how um, survival chances change. In terms of major disability, we drew the data from the uh, Victorian Infant Collaborative Study um, cohorts over um, several years, over 30 years um, nearly here in Victoria. Um, and we also drew on data from the Australian and New Zealand neonatal network. Um, so for example, for the 23 week babies, we had data for, um, uh, I think it was just under hundred survivors born recently to look at the risks of disability. And the final tool that we developed, just mindful of the time there, um, was a tool to help clinicians um, to estimate outcomes um, for these babies. And this was not done as part of the safer care guideline per se, but this was some work that I was doing as my postdoctoral work as well, um, but it fits in quite nicely with the guideline. And so we developed um, a preterm birth outcome predictor. And this is um, a little tool that's designed for Vic babies born in Victoria, and it's designed for clinicians to use prior to the baby's birth. And it's not, um, it's an adjunct for counselling. So when a woman presents the clinician, um, similar to the NICHD out, um, outcome predictor, but the difference is this, you can use this one before birth. So you put in the gestational age of the baby, whether they're male or female, and if you don't know, then female will give you the better survivor data and putting in male will give you the poorer survival outcomes. Whether or not the mother has received antenatal corticosteroids and whether this baby will be inborn or outborn. And basically it then um, calculates um, the risks of dying, of surviving free of major disability and surviving um, with major disability. And the idea is that then a clinician can say to the mother, but look, if we give you antenatal corticosteroids and you're inborn, um, uh, this is how your baby's um, uh, predicted outcome can change. So uh, that's a tool we're just literally finishing and just launching. Um, haven't validated against other cohorts yet, but I would hope to do that in time. Um, so I can tell you more about that. So just in summary, I think we've seen um, around the world that there is certainly increasing willingness to provide intensive care for these um, very immature babies in many high income countries, but certainly not all. Still, we see at the moment that active management is actually still quite rare in Victoria. So only um, 10 babies actively managed over the past decade. Um, so very small numbers. But by 24 weeks here in Victoria, nearly 90% are actively managed. Um, and of those, two thirds will survive to one year of age. Um, and their um, disability data is actually um, uh, quite promising as well. 
And so if parents want active care here in Victoria, then um, we, our guidance, statewide guidance now says that birth conditions should be optimised. So transfer in utero, give antenatal corticosteroids, give magnesium sulfate, have a consultant led team attend the birth to resuscitate the baby, ensure there's multidisciplinary counselling for the parents around survival chances and long-term outcome, and that at all times the emphasis should be on shared decision-making um, with the parents. So I'm going to stop there, just acknowledging all my data sources, um, and um, open up the floor to any question. Oh, Al, um, Alex is going to um, manage the questions for me. Um, depending on how we go for time and questions, I have got some information on the um, long-term outcomes of these babies, but I thought we might, given that this is focusing on the uh, the guideline and particularly around, along the ethical side of it. Um, I thought I might see what questions come up from that first. And then if we have time, we can look at the long-term outcomes. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Rose for what was an absolutely amazing presentation. You know, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, we have a deluge of questions, uh, not unexpectedly. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is we get, I think we'd, we'd really be, and we have enough time to actually go through the neurodevelopmental outcomes, which we can probably structure towards the end of the presentation. But sure. I'm going to start by asking questions from the participants uh, uh, from YouTube first. And I've got a question from one of my nurse colleagues who works in a level two center. So her, her question is, does the condition of the baby at birth, especially between 22 and 24 weeks, influence your decisions to stop resuscitation considering your guidance? And right, that's a fantastic question. Thank you for that. So um, I don't, many of you may know um, Dr. Brett Manley. He's a researcher here in Melbourne. Uh, Brett wrote a paper published in Pediatrics a few years ago, um, uh, which was looking at um, the outcome of babies based on how they looked at birth. And what Brett showed was there was no correlation to how the baby looked at birth and their survival chances. Um, and so um, we said, we have actually written that in the guidance that the condition of the baby at birth should not be used um, uh, to determine whether or not resuscitation should be offered. So in fact, uh, we made that very clear that no condition at birth, um, so it wouldn't be, a, oh, let's just wait and see what this baby looks like when it's born, because we've shown, or Brett's work shown, there is no correlation between how a baby looks uh, and how they're actually likely to, to do. Um, and you know yourself, if a mum's had a GA section, that baby's not gonna come out and breathe. Um, they can be you know, very poor condition at birth, but it doesn't actually mean they're going to do poorly. So um, that's a great question. And we certainly have written that into the guideline. <laughs> so just a follow up question in regards to that is obviously we kind of minimum interventions, you know, the response of the baby to your resuscitative efforts. Now, the BAPM guidance kind of talks about definitely trying to inflate the chest, intubate, yeah. give these babies surfactant. Have you defined a minimum level of intervention, yes. you know, especially yeah. at 22 yeah. weeks? Yes, um, so exactly, so similar. So um, uh, A, B, C, D, you know, in, you know, of airway breathing, circulation, um, surfactant, um, uh, intubation, um, I mean, it depends on the condition of the baby, but yes, that's all outlined in the um, resuscitation flow diagram for them, yeah. And again, we did it for tertiary and non-tertiary because in many non-tertiary units, they would not necessarily have someone with the skill to intubate a 400 gram baby. Um, and so for them, we couldn't say, oh, let's, you know, we couldn't say to them, do blood gases and, and do things that we know aren't, just aren't feasible in that, some of those units. So that was very deliberately why we wrote two pathways, um, you know, to have the best resuscitation you could, but acknowledging that many non-tertiary hospitals just don't have the same, they don't have the, even the numbers of people to come and help at a recess like we do in a tertiary centre where you've got a cast of many people and many, hand, many experienced hands and, you know, all the right equipment at hand. So yeah. we have another question from uh, a colleague of mine. So this is a tertiary consultant who works in India who's uh, taking up the module. So in terms of CPR for babies 22 to 24 weeks, I mean, inflating the chest, how far would you go towards giving compressions and drugs in your setup? 
That was an interesting question, Alec, and I'll actually just uh, go back a slide, if you don't mind. Um, yep, I'll actually absolutely. show you the slide. So uh, what surprised me was uh, when I actually looked at, oh, sorry, no, that's not the one I want. Um, uh, when I actually went back and looked at, um, uh, yes, this one, sorry. When I actually went and looked at the data for all our babies, I actually thought that perhaps um, resuscitation might have meant, oh, they gave the baby a bit of positive pressure and, and then didn't take it any further. But what we saw, in fact, was that these babies, um, uh, the resuscitation, many of these babies had seven or eight different types of resuscitation interventions. And so they were intubated, they got mass ventilation, they got some CPAP, they got intubated, they certainly got some chest compressions, there were babies who got adrenaline. And when I looked at the proportion of babies, what were the outcome um, in terms of survival to one year, more than 50% of the babies who received chest compressions and adrenaline were alive at one year. And so we actually wrote in the guideline that given what we've seen, that in fact, chest compressions and adrenaline may not always be futile in these very immature babies, as many people would say. So we said um, for that, the evidence is still is limited. However, um, that we wouldn't say don't go, you know, don't, um, you know, that don't give, don't not give chest compressions. What am yeah. I trying to say? Um, so it was interesting. Uh, yeah. So I think I was surprised by, I guess, the aggressive, not the aggressiveness, but how, you know, people were making good attempts. It wasn't yeah. half hearted attempts to resuscitate these babies. Uh, if they were going to offer them active care, then they, than they really did. Now, obviously there were situations where in the delivery room it became obvious the baby was not going to survive. And there were certainly babies, as we saw, who died in the delivery room despite resuscitation attempts. But in the tertiary centers, um, that was only 3% of the live births who were resuscitated. So in a tertiary center, if you were actively managed and resuscitated, then 90% of those babies um, were alive to be admitted to NICU. And that was a very different story to what we saw in the outborn babies. Yeah. So just to follow up to the first question. Uh, so just considering the fact that when a baby's born, there's a huge amount of subjectivity as to signs of life and how we interpret them. Uh, we standardize that with monitoring. Should we be trying to define signs of life at 22 and 23 weeks so that we can be more consistent with how we're approaching every baby? Mm, gosh. So here in Australia, we do actually have definitions of, um, which are written by the Perinatal Society of Australia and New Zealand. And we actually have a definition of what a live birth is um, versus a, a fetal death or a stillbirth. Um, and for live birth, our definition is oh, that, yeah. after, you know, quote, after separation from its mother, it's a terrible statement, um, that the fetus shows any signs of life, including pulsation of the cord, movement of involuntary muscles, um, breathing. Um, there's a fourth one. Oh, can't think of the fourth component, but it, you know, it can be not necessarily that the baby comes out and is crying. Uh, it can simply be that the cord's still pulsating um, or that, um, yeah, there's movement of the muscles. And that is um, from, in terms of our coding of live births and stillbirths, that baby would be coded as a live birth, even if we never heard it cry and nobody ever heard a heartbeat. Now, that doesn't mean we'd resuscitate that baby. Um, and again, I think what's really important with the guidelines is that each baby is individual and each mother is individual and each circumstance is individual and you can't have a one size fits all. You can't say do this at 22 weeks or do it. You've got to, you know, it's always individualized. Um, and I think that's one of the really important points about it is that it's not saying to people, you've got to do this. Well, you must do this. It's simply a guideline um, to try and provide some consistency across the state. Um, but of course, every individual baby's management will always be individualized. Um, and that will depend on the team resuscitating them as well, won't it? Like, you know, they, some people will keep going a bit longer than others, you know, so it's a tricky one to, to, um, to answer. So I've got a question from uh, one of our participants who's a consultant at one of our level two centers. And she has a really interesting question on the challenge of counseling parents who would have expectations for resuscitation in level two centers in Australia, where they can't be transferred out. You know, clearly there would be expectations from some parents that their babies yeah. are managed. 
And how do you deal with that in terms of counseling? I mean, in terms of, especially if there's disagreement and the challenges yeah. around that. So a couple of, so first of all, we have a single centralised um, retrieval service for the whole of Victoria. And that's Piper. It used to be called NET. So it used to be the newborn emergency transport service, but now we're perinatal and neonatal and paediatric. So um, a Piper consultant can help provide information for the doctor at the other end of the phone who's saying, what should I tell these parents? And what we've talked about is that we really need to expand our telemedicine so that a Piper consultant can actually be, like we're doing right now, yeah. zoomed in with the parents and the, and the referring hospital staff to have that joint discussion. And that's something we put into the guideline to say we really need to move towards um, more telehealth and if COVID's proven anything it's that we can certainly do it um, and that that would be one way to overcome exactly that issue that you're describing um, that real challenge of um, of uh, of clinicians who um, are faced with having to counsel parents um, and they may not deal with this very often as in the clinicians might in their hospitals we looked at how many babies you know a year it's not many so follow-up question to that from Tori Payne. Uh, do you feel that the Victorian level of care classifications for neonatal units might then impact the outcomes for outborn babies? Uh, clearly considering the geography and the distances and how would, you know, uh, in that question, are we kind of then talking about the self-fulfilling prophecy? And Sorry, um, that's my whole postdoctoral work, it's my whole PhD work. I've spent the past 10 years looking at outcomes of babies born in level one and level two hospitals. Um, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, it is my life passion. I can send you many, many papers on that. Um, does it have an effect? Uh, uh, I guess the thing is, uh, ideally, so the idea of this guideline is that if a woman presents to a level one or level two and the family clearly want active care, then every effort should be made to get that woman to a tertiary centre. That's the bottom line, because we know the baby's outcomes will be better, both in terms of survival and in terms of long-term outcome, if that birth occurs in a tertiary centre. So um, every effort will be made. And because we have a single centralised transport team, we coordinate all the in utero transfers and the bed finding and the battles with the bed finding um, uh, and um, the mode of transport to get that woman down to Melbourne. Um, and if, um, it depends on how immature the baby is, but if it's inevitable that the birth, can, if she cannot be moved in utero, then we will try and get a Piper team to be at the birth. So we will then do it backwards. We'll mobilize. In, in the, in, when I first started in Piper, we used to say, oh, call us back when the baby's born and the baby's alive. Whereas now it's like, tell us as early as you can so we can get to you. And if you can hold, it's always impossible usually, but um, you know, if they're planning on doing a Caesar, for example, can you hold off till we get there? And so we will be at the birth. So the Piper team resuscitate the baby. Now for an outborn 22 weeker, that would not be the case. Um, but for births generally under 28 weeks, um, we try to be at the birth if they can't get the mother to us. So that's been another initiative with the, the retrieval service. So then you've got a specialised team resuscitating the baby. Not always possible. <laughs> completely understandable. And I think, you know, if we look at the diversity, the distances, the geography, and I, I think that that would pretty much answer one of the other questions that's been put forward. So we discussed all the guidelines last week uh, for, you know, kind of management of limits of viability from 27 different countries. And yeah. it was a really interesting kind of an overview of how uh, there's been a huge amount of progress. And obviously, if you look at the BAPM and the new uh, guidelines from Victoria, you know, a risk-based approach is something that's coming into vogue in a big way. The question that I had in particular is, I mean, Australia is so diverse, it's massive geographically. Is that the reason why other states have not yet adopted such an approach or are they in the process of doing it? And, you uh, know. Yeah. So, um, so yes, although we are one country, we are, as we've seen in COVID, we are very much separate states, um, you know, borders locked down. Um, there has always been a really different approach in different areas of Australia, which is quite interesting. So WA, Western Australia, 
Um, they have a single tertiary centre, which is in Perth. So that huge geographical space and all the mothers come to Perth to King Eddie, to King Edward Memorial Hospital. Um, and their outborn birth rates actually really good, they have like less than 10% of outborn babies over in WA, despite those huge distances. Now they've always been quite proactive with managing very extremely preterm babies, way more than any other state in Australia. New South Wales are still um, uh, less, uh, uh, Victoria is a bit more, um, New South Wales is still, it's really 24 weeks, um, and but in, in New South Wales have actually just put together a steering committee to develop their own guidance. Um, they came to us <laughs> and to me and said, this is silly for us to reinvent the wheel when you've done all this work. Can you be on our steering committee? So at the moment I'm helping New South Wales to develop theirs. And because I'm obviously from New South Wales and trained there, I do have a very good insight into their you know, hospitals. Queensland also developed their own guideline. And again, they're a very big geographical state. All their tertiary centers are in Townsville and Brisbane. Um, so they already had their own guidance, but they had not developed it down as low as for 22. That only started at 23. And we felt in Victoria that we couldn't close our eyes and pretend that we couldn't hear and see what was going on around the world. And the parents aren't stupid. They read social media, they know what's happening. Um, and so we couldn't bury our heads in the sand and say, well, we'll just pretend the 22 weekers will go away. So, um, so each state remains um, same, same, but different. Uh, and each state does have its own approach. Um, and it's, it's always been very interesting that, yeah, we're one country and yet we're, we have very different management. I would echo that we're actually smaller and I mean, if you look at management in the UK, there's a really nice paper that's been published by Professor Marlowe, which actually yeah. looks at, you know, the differences in management just from the north of the UK to the south yeah. in terms of that active prevention. Uh, yeah. Intensity of perinatal care, Neil's paper, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I completely echo that sentiment. Uh, so there's a question from one of our consultants uh, who, again, so certain aspects obviously very difficult to quantify and similarly like if you had multiples at 23 weeks in a level two center would you approach that similar to babies born at 22 weeks and you know it, it, that it, that's really tricky uh it does push the zone of parental discretion slightly that way um and so um you know if you had outborn twins oh Prince Philip's just died. Oh dear. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's just come through my breaking. <laughs> sorry, I just looked down and saw that. Um, oh dear. Um, oh, sorry, Alec. Okay, uh, sorry. Shock. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that out loud. I just looked down. I suddenly just flashed up in front of me. Um, sorry, what am I saying? Okay, outborn, 23 weeks, male, no antenatal corticosteroids. We know those babies' outcome is going to be so much poorer than inborn, female, well-grown, um, steroid-loaded girls. And so that would push the zone of parental discretion a little bit downward because you would say, well, um, you know, these, these babies' survival chances are just not as good. But that would be part of the counselling of the parents as well to explain to them why, you know, all babies are not the same. Um, and it's a bit like with paramedic practice, you know, when I, I do a lot of training with paramedics, I help them write guidelines for babies. Um, and I say to them, yeah, sure, in a hospital, we resuscitate 24 week babies uh, and they do they do well. But when they're born in the toilet at home at 24 weeks, it, that's a completely different story. So you can't treat them the same. <laughs> you can't expect the same outcomes and you can't um you know uh, expect that what's going to happen in a hospital at 24 weeks is remotely possible uh when a baby's born in the back of an ambulance or en route to hospital so um again i think it comes down to individualizing care for each pregnancy each baby um yeah so and so while we were trying to create broad guidance principles um of course we kept coming back to the fact that it's it's just a guideline and there will always be individual circumstances. And, and again, hospitals are encouraged to ring Piper, to talk to the obstetric and or neonatal or both at the same time conference call with both consultants about what the appropriate 
options are, what to tell the parents and what to offer the parents. Um, and that's always an individual um, decision, always. So just a, a comment from one of our, uh, and, and a follow-up question from one of our nurses. Uh, so, I mean, I think what she said is absolutely fantastic to have a, a policy of accepting babies, you know, irrespective of your unit size and trying to facilitate those transfers yeah. because it, you know, is, it can be a huge yeah. anxiety for level two and level one centers. So, you know, very just... anxiety provoking. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing um, we saw, and this was a couple of years ago, was that um, sometimes uh, a, a level one or a level two would ring through um, uh, saying, you know, I want to transfer this woman and they'd be told, oh, we don't resuscitate babies at 23 weeks. And yet, they would then have back transfers of babies coming back to their unit who'd been born at a tertiary centre at 23 weeks and were now 100 and whatever days old coming back to... So they knew that we were... So we were, there was this mixed messaging, you know, people saying to them, we don't resuscitate babies at 23 weeks. And yet they knew <laughs> that there were 23-week babies in the tertiary centre. So um, th there was the messaging was inconsistent and that was something that was really important to address in the guideline so that all consultants at tertiary level, Piper, across the board would not say, we don't do this or we won't move her until X gestation. Um, and that was a really key component of, of this guideline. And to do that, we had to get consensus from all the tertiary um, units that they would agree that there could not be bed block, there couldn't be priority for more mature babies. Um, uh, and that they would all agree that if we, we put this in the guideline that they would, um, that they were willing to um, accept it. Mm. So another really good question from one of our grid trainees. So she's spoken about the balance of uh, cesarean section as active intervention in maternal uh, interests versus, you know, a baby born at 22 weeks. What do we think about offering cesarean section for survival of the baby and making its chances better? Yeah. So we looked at that really carefully and we looked at the evidence from around the world um, and there wasn't compelling evidence to actually show a survival advantage for cesarean section over vaginal birth at 22 weeks. And so in the guideline we wrote that um, uh, in a lack of, with a lack of clear evidence to support or refute that it would be an individual decision, um, that, but you would have to discuss with the woman the implications for her future pregnancies, given that you would be doing a classical cesarean section at 22 weeks. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so for fetal indications that, you know, there, there would, it would have to be really clear to the, to the mother what the risks were, um, both for this pregnancy as well, but, you know, yeah. that's yeah. You know, still major operation. 